Hello, this is Dr. Llewellyn Eisen, and this is the second of our two lectures on the unit uh, with the topic of the rise of Christian monasticism. So our goals for this unit were to, or are, to consider the historical and philosophical inheritance of Christian monasticism, which we did in the last unit, and then also to consider the various types of monastic movements that will emerge just prior to and after the legalization of Christianity. So we're gonna talk about um, the two main models of monastic life, the Cenobitic and the Eremitic, and then also um, the type of ascetic behaviors that are really quite normal to uh, both of those types of monastic lives. So of course, um, any lesson that I teach is going to involve some vocabulary. And so let's think for a moment about the word monk. So monk comes from the Greek word monos, meaning alone or left alone or forsaken. Notice that this is um, either an object or a direct object. One can uh, choose to be alone or one can be left alone. Those are two very different uh, things. But generally, in a monastic life, an individual has made the decision to be apart. And it doesn't mean apart to the degree that one has no interaction, but the amount of interaction is certainly something that is controlled. So the two main models that I want to introduce you to are the Eremitic and the Cenobitic. So you probably see the word hermit in Eremitic. And hermit might make you think of hermit crab, a crab that walks around with its home on its back. In many ways, that's not a bad, it's not a bad illustration. A hermit is a monastic figure who is independent of other institutions. So they live on their own. And ideally, they do not rely on uh, any other person or institution for support. Now, in the history of Christian monasticism, um, while a hermit is seen as the sort of the highest, most elite form of monastic life, it's also the hardest. And it is not seen as something that you enter into lightly, as you will see in our reading on um, Pelagia and Simeon the Stylite. The other type of monastic life here um, that I've highlighted is that of the Cenobitic. That comes from the Greek word koinonia, which means community. Cenobitic life is a monastic life in community with others. And these are all others who ideally have the same status. They have renounced um, their money, their property, their family, their authority, and they have come together to live in community with other people. And you know, I, I said the Eremitic life is, is the hardest, but I don't know that it's the hardest. I suppose it depends on the person and their needs. One might be harder than the other for one person or not. I don't know. There are other forms of monastic life. There are spiritual marriages. There are the There is the practice of being a grazer. There are skeets. But these are the two that I want you to think about for specifically our lesson today. We're going to meet examples of both. Uh, irrespective of the model, whether one is a hermit or whether one is a Cenobite, um, all monastic life involves some form of asceticism. So let's take a look at the different types of ascetic behaviors in which monastic figures engage. One key form of ascesis is isolation, and that might mean you know, one of a couple different things. Um, these are some Cappadocian um, cave cells. And so inside these uh, little holes here are uh, beautiful little cells in which 
um, a monk might uh, happily live, actually quite comfortably. Uh, here we have uh, a Coptic monk who um, lives fairly isolated uh, in his little cell. And he owns nothing but what you see actually here in this image. But we don't want to assume that um, these uh, monastic cells, these little cave cells are unadorned. Uh, the interior of some of them can actually be quite alarmingly intri intricate and beautiful. Some cave monasteries might look like nothing on the outside, but the interior uh, is quite spectacular. Isolation can also look like this. This is a Cenobitic um, monastic community. This is in Bethlehem, and it's the size of a small city. Uh, it's quite elaborate. There are um, thousands, of, there's room for thousands uh, of monks in this community, and you can see that um, the cells are like all the way along here. It's not just what you see right here. And it's so beautiful the way it just blends into, um, blends into the landscape. It's it's really um, eco architecture at its finest. And isolation can also look like this. This is a uh, monastery at uh, of Meteora, um, which is in Greece, and it's at the top uh, of this cliff here. Or it might look like this. This is a um, little cell that's tucked away in a forest. Um, and is a lot easier to get to than, for example, a monastery like that. But then that's part of the point, right? Is that you can't just stroll up to it like it's a bar in Manhattan. Isolation might also look like this. Um, you might be surprised to know that if you do a Google search for monasteries in the Pacific Northwest, this is all of the monasteries that um, will pop up. Uh, did you know they were there? right? Did you know that they are around us? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, some are a little harder to see than others. This is a fairly obvious church. This is the um, All Merciful Savior Russian Orthodox Monastery. It looks very much like a Russian Orthodox church. Um, this does not <laughs> look like a monastery. But again, if you go inside, um, it is completely inside, the interior is completely reorganized such that um, you would think you were in 11th century Constantinople. Other forms of ascesis include habit, and habit is the clothing that is worn. Um, sometimes it's very obvious the um, what status or station or what group um, a monastic figure might belong to. For example, a Coptic monk is almost always adorned in this fashion with his characteristic cap. Um, this is my friend, actually, Father Chifan of the um, monastery that I just showed you, this monastery right here on Vashon Island, the All Merciful Savior. And he is very much uh, adorned like a um, Russian Orthodox monk. Um, these are some Greek nuns. And here down here we have some Roman Catholic um, uh, examples of Roman Catholic stages of monastic life. So here we have an aspirant, a postulant, a novice, and temporary professed. So you can see that they are dressed according to their station as they progress from um, maybe thinking about to, um, you know, she's thinking, well, maybe do I want this life? And this woman has committed to this life. So I guess before we turn to the next form of ascesis, I do want to say that habit is something that is uh, important for monks and nuns because it marks who they are in society. It functions in many ways, like any other type of religious garb. For example, if a um, committed Muslim woman was to wear a hijab, it's not a way of hiding who you are. It's a way of showing who you are to the world. Other forms of ascesis include diet. Um, many, even most, but certainly not all monastics are vegetarian. 
Um, there are some parts of the world where based on the weather and the work that they do, it's simply not healthy to be um, a vegetarian. But again, um, diet has to do with the regulation of food, not with the denial of food. So monks and nuns eat based on the liturgical calendar. If there are fasting seasons, um, and there are many fasting seasons, then their, um, their diet reflects that, which means there might be restrictions on oil, on meat, on dairy, or on times when one is eating. But eating is certainly a communal experience and can be joyful as well as solemn. Other forms of ascesis include sleep. Actually, the denial of sleep. Um, because uh, the primary job of a monastic figure is to engage in prayer, and because prayer is a 24-hour uh, procedure, if you were to visit a monastery, you might actually see monks engaged in the act of napping. Um, in my first time in a monastery, I was so delighted to learn from um, the mother superior that now it's nap time. I asked her where everyone was. Everyone seemed to have disappeared, and she said, oh, we're all napping. And I thought, that's brilliant. Um, but, you know, if you're up from three to four engaged in prayers, then, of course, um, around, you know, maybe two o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to need a nap. So if you see monastic figures engaging in a little cat nap, it's not because they're lazy. Uh, it's because, you know, maybe they were praying between two and three in the morning. Other forms of ascesis include continence. This is something we've spent a bit of time with already, so it should not surprise you to learn that continence or the denial of sexual activity would be something that would be common to monastic figures. So um, refraining from engaging in sexual activity doesn't mean that all monks and nuns have never had sex. It doesn't mean that they hate their bodies. It doesn't mean that they are um, that they think that sex is bad or that they're um, sexually stunted or anything along those lines. It just means that they refrain <laughs> from engaging in sexual activity or that they don't think that it matters as much as other things. We live in a society that's very focused on pleasure um, and very focused on um, engaging in sexual activity all the way up to or even at the moment of death, right? It seems like it's a very, it's something that's very uh, important in our culture. Um, and it's not that it's not important in other, in monastic culture, it's just that it's understood differently. Other forms of ascesis include poverty. For the most part, in um, the majority of monastic um, communities, an individual renounces their possessions at the time they enter a monastery. Either those possessions are given to other people or given to other members of their family, or they're given to the monastery as a way of helping to support the monastery. Most monasteries try to be self-sustaining and um, produce <clears throat> the things that they need and not purchase things outside of the monastery, but that's not always possible. Early Christian monastic groups were not um, engaged in the activity of begging. They tried to be self-sustaining, and if they weren't, they would produce things that they could sell and then purchase the things that they needed. Other forms of ascesis include hospitality. Here is the previously met um, Father Trifon from the All Merciful Savior Russian Orthodox Monastery. And here is my um, Easter or my Orthodox Christian history class when we took a trip out to the monastery to visit them. I believe this was fall of 2018. So, um, Monasteries are people's homes, and for the most part, if you ask if you can come visit, um, they are supposed to say yes, and they are supposed to welcome you and offer you um, hospitality. That might include something to eat or something to drink or a place to rest. 
Other forms of ascesis include obedience, and that can take a couple of different forms. Um, one might be um, required to uh, work in the kitchen. Here are a couple examples of that. One might be required to engage in the um, in the cycles of prayer. This looks like it's taking place in the evening. Um, one might be required to uh, work in the fields or to work with the animals. Here we have two examples of that. And I think it's clear that not all of the obedient tasks in which um, people have to engage, they're not all onerous. I mean, he's having fun. She, I mean, who would not have fun? Like, look at this. She's got mini ponies and baby mini ponies. Absolutely adorable. Th this doesn't look as fun to me, but it may be fun for them. And for the most part, as you will uh, learn in reading your text on the Pacomian rules, people take it in turn to engage in the different kinds of work that is required, whether that is working in the fields or working in the kitchen or working doing the actions of the liturgy. And really, that is the primary job of a monastic, um, the role of prayer. Um, to refer back to a previous lesson, one of the ways in which Christians drew from prevailing Roman culture was in their understanding of time and liturgical time. And so Christians composed a cycle of prayers that occupied essentially a 24 hour period. And the primary single most important job of a monastic figure is the activity of prayer. And this can be over the course of the 24 hour period. And some of you might think, well, that's not even a real job, much less an important job. But I would ask you this, if we don't consider prayer to be important or valuable, why do we do it so much? <laughs> why is it often the thing to which people who don't even consider themselves religious turn? Within a short period of time, a series of services will be developed um, that will take um, an individual from sunset all the way to the following day of sunset. And so Vespers, Compline, the Midnight Office, Matins or Orthros, the first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour, and then Tipica will organize the day over um, a series of liturgical prayers in which people will take it in turn. So our homework questions for um, this particular unit, I'm not going to talk you through because um, I'm just going to uh, read through your homework and see what it was that you identified from the Pacomian rules, um, the various things that reflect the concerns that individuals living in community faced. I know that I personally learned a lot about fears of intimacy, about concerns over sharing, uh, concerns over health, and so I'm interested to see what it is that you found. So when we think about our Eremitic and our Cenobitic monks, there are two key figures that um, really typify these um, modes of monastic life. So here we have Alexandria. This is modern day Egypt here. And um, along the upper part of the Nile, a figure named Antony known as Antony the Great will be credited with being the first Christian monk. He wasn't at all the first Christian monk, um, but he's probably the most famous early Christian monk. Additionally, in the southern part of the Nile, we will have St. Pacomius, who will establish um, along an area known as the Tibet, um, a series of monastic houses um, that will really set the standard for Cenobitic monasticism. And even though I didn't have you read a selection from the life of St. Antony, for your homework, you have been asked to read some of the um, Pacomian rules, which again, give you some sense of what life was like communally for people who lived in the monasteries. 
Early monastic sites included not only the life uh, or the area of Antony and Pacomius, but also monasteries in Bethlehem and Antioch, eventually in Constantinople, but also in the West. Monasticism was very popular among um, Christians, not just Christians in leadership, but also laity. And so it really um, emerged in force in the third and fourth century, in part because of what I said at the end of the last uh, lecture, in part because um, there was a resistance to the alignment between Christianity and the imperial house, and then the, of course, the legalization of Christianity. There were many people who thought that, um, that the benefits provided by the government um, had allowed Christianity to deteriorate. And so they sought um, a more rigorous Christian life within the organization of monasticism. So it's not the case that um, monasticism, once it emerged, um, that it remained stagnant and um, unchanging. In fact, in the eastern portion of the Roman Empire, this figure uh, pictured here on the left of St. Basil the Great, whose uh, lifespan, as you could see, was the fourth century, Basil introduced some important changes into monastic life. And in the process, he utilized uh, the monk and monastic life to benefit society. He did not believe that people should withdraw from society, but that they should be part of society in a different way. So under Basil, um, he created hospitals. He was responsible for a great amount of food collection and distribution and for assisting when um, wars impacted the movement of people um, and immigration. In the West, St. Benedict uh, in uh, the subsequent century he legislated monastic life by creating a rule that very much like Pacomius has endured to this day. He adapted, West, uh, he adapted monastic life to suit um, Western needs around things like clothing and food. Um, and in the West, with the collapse of certain institutions, um, monasteries in time became preservers of culture because as you know from having read the Pacomian rules um, everyone in a monastery had to read and if everyone's reading that means people are producing books and so in time monasteries become um, not just the producers of books, but also the preservers of books, as well as the preservers of other elements and aspects of um, Western culture. It's important to note that um, there was criticism of monasticism. Some objected to the core beliefs of continents held by monks. And some objected to the fact that ascetics lived outside of the community. And so what? Who cares? Um, well, for some aspects of the hierarchy, because ascetics lived outside of the community, this meant that they were beyond the control of the bishops. And also um, bishops were concerned that um, monastic life was offering alternatives to things that were considered foundational aspects of society. In time, however, monasticism largely became integrated into the broader Christian community and in time played a significant role in the transformation, cultivation, and preservation of Christian life. So let's turn to our texts. So the life of St. Simeon the Stylite uh, is a really uh, fascinating account of someone, um, of, a, of a Syrian saint who um, was part of a very unique ascetic activity, and that is pillar sitting. Simeon lived uh, between 
you know, 390 and 459 ish. And the pillar itself, the actual column here, right here, and here, and here, is a transitional aspect of his ascetic regime. As you know from the text, from reading the account, um, his ascetic activity was very morbid and was actually um, quite concerning to those uh, within his community. But pillar sitting certainly was not unheard of. Um, and in fact, uh, I would argue, let's go past this, that there are even today people who uh, are very uh, interested in moving themselves as high up to the heavens as they can get. Here is an example of, I don't know that I'd call her a pillar sitter, but this is a uh, Russian dancer who um, has an Instagram account where she posts pictures of herself on these um, high spaces. And here is also um, a uh, uh, man who also does the same. He actually fell to his death last year. Um, but there he is in, I believe, um, his last uh, time uh, ascending the highest point he could. Um, I'm going to just scoot back here real quick. This actually is a photograph of um, Simeon's actual pillar. This is the base of where he sat in the um, and and the the architecture around his pillar is um, the um, the monastic community that was built up around him. Um, this type of um, ascetic activity really drew people to the pillar saints. As you know from the account, um, people came and asked for prayers. They asked for healings. Um, he became something of a national treasure. And in fact, there were several pillar saints who followed in his, I was going to say footsteps, but maybe just footstep since he only went up. Um, and also imitated this type of ascetic practice. But... Um, Pillar saints were not the only uh, type of um, ascetic activities. Um, there were also those who practiced extreme fasting or who um, abandoned society in other ways. The other uh, primary source that I asked you to read for this lesson is um, from the life of St. Pelagia, uh, seen here in this Western image as a Cortesian. And um, she is um, greatly influenced by the preaching of the bishop and decides that she wants to live um, her life as an ascetic. And so she uh, renounces um, her gorgeous clothing and her adornments and becomes a secluded uh, figure. In some accounts, she adopts the garb of, uh, of, a, of a man. And so... And, and part of that, of course, has to do with protection, but also remember, this is the renunciation of gender. This is the performance of gender. It's a way of demonstrating a transcendence of one's, what would be considered one's weaker qualities. So the homework questions that I asked you to do for this uh, lesson on these two important and unique saints is to identify what ascetic behaviors distinguish a monastic individual from a layperson, to identify in the texts how asceticism enables a holy person to function. In other words, what does what does Simeon's um, climbing up a pillar liberate him to do? What does Pelagia's uh, renunciation of her um, of her garments. What does it liberate her to do? Additionally, if you want, um, feel free to share. If you engage in any ascetic practices, uh, feel free to share. Well, if we were together in the class, you would share with your conversation partners. But you can share with me in your homework if you want. You can also completely ignore this question altogether. 
So um, to conclude, let's think about some of the outcomes of Christian asceticism. All right. Specific to um, question two, really, what does asceticism enable a holy person to do? It gives them access to be educated and to educate. We saw this in Tekla. Where's Tekla? Here she is here, right? She renounces marriage and it frees her to learn from Paul and it frees her to um, go forward with her own community. The outcome of Christian asceticism is also the rejection of marriage um, by renouncing um, by by renouncing her ties, her social obligation of marriage, she is able to embark on a life independent of that bond. Another outcome of Christian asceticism is freedom of movement, again, with Tekla. And we see this with Pelasia as well. Um, they renounce uh, these social norms and they are able to make decisions um, of their own free will. Another outcome of Christian asceticism is protection. We certainly saw this uh, with Tekla, and we see this with Pelasia as well, because she adopts male garb. She is protected from harassment that she might otherwise endure. Another outcome of Christian asceticism is authority, because a person um, rejects some of these social norms they are seen as having um, greater wisdom than people who say, oh, okay, I guess I'll get married because it's what I'm supposed to do. So to conclude, Christian asceticism will in time challenge the idea of Christianity as being part of God's will and therefore inevitable, inevitable in the Roman Empire. Christian asceticism will challenge complacent Christianity, and it will argue against just being um, a nominal Christian because it is certainly not illegal to, um, or because it is legal, right? One doesn't have to be concerned. Christian asceticism will certainly be influenced by contemporary asceticism that is already common within Roman society. Christian asceticism will provide opportunity for choices to support sexual, marital, or procreative desires. And then, finally, Christian asceticism will influence Christian leadership. From this point on, it will be expected of Christian leaders that they will engage in certain ascetic behaviors, not necessarily all of them, but that they will be largely untouched by wealth, that they will live a life that is not necessarily impoverished, but one that embraces voluntary poverty, embraces voluntary chastity, and refrains from reveling in things that what would be considered base forms of humanity would uh, enjoy. All right. Any questions, feel free to email me at isenbl at plu.edu. And I'll see you next time. Bye.